Hello, my name is Urania Yerutaku. I'm Secretary General of Lighting Europe, and I'm going to be talking to you about the European Green Deal and how I think this growth strategy for the EU will impact the lighting industry. For those of you who may not know us, Lighting Europe is a trade association representing lighting manufacturers from across Europe. We're based in Brussels. We have 33 members, a combination of companies and national associations. Altogether, we stand for around 1,000 companies from across Europe, 100,000 jobs, and 20 billion annual turnover. Within Lighting Europe, our members uh, agreed on a strategic roadmap for the industry to deliver the value of lighting by 2025. We developed that in 2015 and assessed our progress in 2019. It is the role of Lighting Europe to make sure that the industry is on track and that we will achieve our vision in time. Uh, our assessment is that we're making good progress. Lighting industry is harnessing the potential of lidification and sustainability. We're delivering energy efficient and more sustainable circular products. The increased value of lighting to society will now come from intelligent lighting systems and human-centric lighting. And to, to do that, to achieve that value for people and for the companies, for the industry, what we need is to make sure we have a healthy regulatory framework. So simple, sound rules that are better enforced. I want to talk to you about the European Green Deal, which is a big strategic priority coming out of the EU and that will guide policies and legislation for at least the next five years. So how it came about is that the European Commission has a new president and a new college uh, that took office last year in 2019. This new president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, set out her vision uh, back in the summer of 2019 and her strategic priorities. And she announced she would focus on two key elements. First one is digitalization and the second one is the European Green Deal. And when you read the document, when you read the priorities, when you listen to the speeches, it is clear that we are making a very strong commitment to green policies. We're talking about becoming climate neutral, the world's first climate neutral uh, continent by 2050, uh, a 5% further increase to our target to reduce emissions by 2030, um, including also commitments to help finance this transition uh, to a greener economy, so discussions about a strategy for sustainable financing, uh, a sustainable Europe investment plan, and the commitment that the EIB financing, the European Investment Bank's finances, will also include green conditionality. Now, if you think back to what the world was like a year ago, about a year ago, uh, before COVID, remember the backdrop for this political vision at the time was people on the streets demonstrating for change. We had the Fridays for Future demonstrations. Greta Thunberg was addressing the United Nations. She also came and addressed the European Union. People asked for change and people voted for change also. We saw that after the elections to the European Parliament in May 9, 2019, where the main center-left and center-right parties saw their power reduced. Uh, and on the contrary, the Green Party gained more seats, it gained in prominence. But more generally, when you talk to these members of European Parliament, you see that across the political spectrum, irrespective of their political party, politicians are now more green-minded. Uh, from a politics side, if, if you do the numbers, today in the Parliament, there's no clear majority, there's no clear alliance, and therefore, the Green Party becomes a very interesting and a, a, a very strong potential ally. Uh, and that means that the p parties, other parties, will be more likely to make uh, additional green concessions in order to get what they want voted through. So the European Green Deal was adopted as soon as the Commission came into office within the first 100 days of the European Commission, new European Commission starting to work. And it was presented as a growth strategy that will transform the Union into a modern, resource-efficient and competitive economy where economic growth will be decoupled 
from resource use. And there was a clear commitment that, that no person and no place, no territory will be left behind in acknowledgement of the fact that there will be some hard and difficult transitions that will need to be made. The language was very clear. It remains very clear. The European Green Deal is our new growth strategy. It will cut emissions and still create jobs. This is the way forward. And the person in charge of delivering on the European Green Deal is Franz Timmermans, the Executive Vice President of the European Commission. So, so what is it? If you, if you start looking about at it, what, what is this? It's a roadmap. Uh, it sets out a list of policies and measures that will need to be implemented. Uh, in Europe, if we are going to uh, deliver on our green ambitions, it includes a, a variety of different uh, sectors. So as you would expect, transport and mobility, we talk about energy, we talk about more ambitious climate targets. What I will focus on in this presentation, what is more closely linked and most likely to impact the lighting Europe the lighting industry most in Europe is the circular economy and toxic free environment initiatives and the commitment to buildings renovation. So I'm going to start off with the circular economy aspects first of all. These are not new. You've heard me speak at the past lead professional symposiums about them. these. The discussion here is about how we can influence design of products and how we can provide impose product specific requirements in order to deliver more sustainable uh, products and a more sustainable economy more generally. If I'm going to summarize the key initiatives we can expect to see in terms of rules over the next four or five years coming out of Europe, one thing, the first thing we will see clearly is more requirements around sustainable products. So more parameters, more principles, more rules requiring durability, reusability, upgradability, uh, repairability, uh, addressing the presence of hazardous substances, um, enabling remanufacturing and high quality recycling of interest to, to, to the lighting industry and uh, past discussions on light as a service. Also a commitment to incentivize product as a service business models as well. And let's be honest, this is not all news for the lighting industry. We've already seen this uh, clear signal come out of the eco-design and labeling rules that we'll start applying as of next year on 1st of September, uh, where we have clear requirements to be able to remove uh, light sources and separate control gear from uh, luminaires and to make them replaceable as well, easily, either by a professional or by the end user themselves. And actually, we also have the obligation now to provide information to, to the customer about whether their product contains replaceable components and how these are replaced by a professional or an end user. Lighting Europe has developed uh, a pictogram that is freely available for all to use to communicate this new obligation. Uh, we have developed guidelines to help companies understand and apply the new eco-design and labeling rules to your product. They are available free of charge on our website for any company globally. Uh, it's basically our contribution to the industry based on uh, the experience we have had over the past five plus years of negotiating and, and discussing these new rules, first with the European Commission and with national ministries, and now also with market surveillance authorities. So please, I encourage you to go and, and visit that website and, and make sure you're ready for the new requirements that come into effect as of 1st September 2021. The second big element of circular economy is around a toxic free environment and this commitment to remove as many hazardous substances as possible already at the design stage in order to reduce the risk to users and to the planet and to improve also the recyclability and the reuse of the product and its materials. There's two main takeaways when you start reading all the promises and all also proposals on a toxic free environment. First is that we're moving away from substances that have been identified as posing a risk and that are clearly labeled in a, in a, in a list, for example, under the REACH regulation where we have the list of substances of very high concern, 200 plus substances listed there. And 
substances that are also often banned, for example, under, under ROS as well. So we're moving away from that approach of substances that have been shown to pose a risk and are clearly regulated to addressing substances that are hazardous and have the potential to one day pose a risk, especially in terms of recyclability and reusability. And think, if you think about it, the idea of having more durable uh, products and, and, and having components and products staying on the market and staying up in, in, in service for longer does require us to deal with this question of legacy substances, substances that were used at the time we made the product uh, and when there was no problem or no knowledge around them, but which 10, 15 years down the line have been acknowledged to pose a risk and are now restricted. So we're moving away from these clear lists of hazard of risk clear list of substances that pose a risk to the general more wider concept of hazardous substances that's the first main takeaway the second one is that you can expect a proliferation of information requirements across the supply chain so you should be trying to get more information out of your suppliers and you as lighting manufacturers will be expected to provide more information downstream across the value chain to consumers and ultimately recyclers. Now we've seen the first sign of that with the April database with information on uh, the new labeling rules and some technical quality parameters of lighting. Uh, we also have a new database being developed by the European Chemicals Agency where suppliers will be required to provide information on substances of very high concern within articles in their products and that obligation starts on the 5th of January 2021 so now six months time now um, and we we see a promise for more digital information systems clearly with discussions about digital product passports and, and the vision for a European circular data space so at some point um, making all these databases interlink with each other. So what you can expect, therefore, also, is that you will be required to provide more information publicly about what's in your products. Now, the circular economy uh, ambition uh, of the EU, uh, I think you will be relieved to know, does not focus only on creating obligations for manufacturers and suppliers. It also tries to stimulate demand for these greener, better products. Um, so we are already seeing the first uh, proposals in Europe's consumer laws, uh, asking consumers what kind of information do you need? Do you need more labels? Do you need more scoring systems in order to choose the more environmentally friendly uh, product? Uh, we're also discussing introduction of a right to repair, a fundamental right to have your product repaired as a consumer in Europe, and that can be backed up by guarantees, and also discussing including mandatory requirements under green public procurement to make sure that organizations are also sourcing responsibly uh, and are supporting a, a greener economy. And finally, we are putting our money where our mouth is and where our ambitions is. So we expect, first of all, companies to provide more information, of course, about their environmental practices in terms of non-financial disclosure obligations, but also looking to develop environmental accounting principles. Uh, to We are now negotiating a new taxonomy uh, based on environmental criteria for, for companies, and that will be used to guide investments by financial uh, investors. So encourage them to also invest in, in the better, greener company and the better, greener product. And also thinking of using um, economic instruments, for example, landfill and incineration taxes, or allowing member states to use VAT rates in order to guide customer choice to the greener, better product. So if I'm going to sum up, to sum up the circular economy side of things, you can expect to see more requirements on product design, more requirements on product information regarding substances that are in that product and providing that information publicly and all the way down to the value chain and eliminating these substances as well, if you can. Uh, you can expect many more databases and you can hope that customers will be encouraged, will be sufficiently incentivized to invest in that direction as well. Now, the second element I promised to, to explain of the European Green Deal that will impact uh, lighting industry and, and has a clear potential for, for the industry is the European Renovation Wave. Now, 
buildings figured prominently in the European Green Deal because they account for 40% of the energy consumed in Europe. And the Commission already acknowledges that the current rates of renovation of public and private buildings should at least be doubled if we're going to achieve our green ambitions. And there's no need to convince anybody the value of renovation of buildings is already crystal clear to the European Union and to regulators. It is the Commission itself that says that 75% of existing building stocks in Europe are energy inefficient. In 2050, almost 80% of today's buildings will still be in use. And on average, only 1% of buildings undergo renovations every year. So we really need to step it up. The benefits that lighting can deliver are obvious. First of all, in terms of energy savings, we all know that. We've done very well at product level already with the transition to LED technologies. And now with the installation of lighting systems uh, with uh, controls uh, to optimize use, we can see even more savings. These are numbers that the Commission acknowledges itself. But most importantly, and to not waste this important opportunity to renovate Europe's building stock, what lighting can deliver is better buildings for people inside. So and this is an opportunity to really promote the, the benefits of human-centric lighting for people and, and how lighting can uh, influence health, well-being, and performance of people indoors. And as we've all come out of a lockdown, uh, I think we all now have more sensitivity towards that um, side of things. In Lighting Europe, we've already adopted and, and, and communicated very strongly a set of recommendations. Our motto is no renovation without lighting. If you're going to renovate, you also have to renovate the lighting. And we make some recommendations about how to prioritize investments. We say first focus on non-residential buildings, only finance LED lighting um, in combination with controls and sensors. Prioritize a full renovation of the luminaires, not just relamping. Make sure you apply the smart readiness indicator in order to really reap the potential of having smart buildings and interconnected systems uh, in a building. Uh, introduce a mandatory minimum requirement on indoor environmental quality. Don't just stick to energy savings. Go beyond that and make buildings that are good for people as well as the planet. Uh, and our final but very important recommendation is that if you want the renovation to benefit from the available subsidy, from the available public financing, then what you have to be sure is to make the renovation of the lighting a mandatory precondition. We also go into a bit more detail about the quality of the lighting, uh, and what parameters it should satisfy, so what standards and uh, uh, what minimum smart readiness level indicators they, they should satisfy. And we've gone this is now the time to act. We've gone strong on this because it is now that we are shaping the European policies and the financial instruments for renovation, in particular in response to the impact of COVID-19 and the need to now um, stimulate the economy. Within Lighting Europe, we've immediately reached out to the top levels in the European Commission. So we've reached out to commissioners who work on policy files that can help shape this future renovation policy and the financial instruments for it, the investments for it, and the conditions for investing. Uh, and we're meeting with their advisors to make sure that our recommendations are reflected in the final policies and in the final financial conditionalities. Um, our recommendations are online. You can find them on our website. We've also gone very vocal on social media, uh, calling for ro no renovation without lighting. And we've uh, teamed up with uh, the heating and cooling and the ventilation sectors and made an alliance around indoor environmental quality uh, and published a manifesto on healthy buildings for all, where we explain the importance of going beyond energy savings to also go for healthy buildings in this renovation wave and to make sure that healthy buildings also means the lighting, not just the heating and cooling, not just the air quality. So not just air and thermal uh, comfort, but also the visual comfort that lighting can offer. 
to help keep our members uh, on top of things and to, to make sure that also regulators remember that we're still here and we still have a voice and still want things. We, we set up um, the Lightning Europe Brussels Direct webinars. They are available to our members. We have two, three, sometimes four a month, depends on how, how busy we can be. Uh, and basically we bring experts, uh, including regulators, to talk about hot topics that we all care about. So we've hosted the gentleman in the European Commission who leads on the Circular Economy Action Plan back in May. We had the lady in charge of the EU chemical strategy, which we expect to see published later this year in, in June. We hosted a member of European Parliament who is drafting the Parliament's opinion on legislation that should address non-compliance online. That's a big problem for Lighting Europe. Making sure we have a level playing field also means making sure that what's illegal offline is illegal online. Um, we recently had uh, uh, the, le the leader of the recyclers industries organization explaining what their priorities are, what kind of information they would like to see from lighting manufacturers and their views on the new database being developed by the European Chemicals Agency. And you can expect to see more from us on those substance requirements, the chemicals database, and the financial instruments for renovation after the summer break. Timeline. Where we're at now is that uh, everything, as you know, was on pause while we dealt with the immediate impact of COVID. But now we see consultations are being launched, proposals are being drafted. So the EU uh, mechanism is now slowly going back to a more business as usual, shall we say, uh, rhythm. Um, I think in June alone, there were around 60 plus uh, consultations uh, launched by the European Commission. Thankfully, not all of them are relevant to lighting because that would have really led to canceling summer holidays. But um, there is a clear timetable to get proposals and policies adopted and published over the next two years and to even revise existing legislation to make sure that it reflects, this old legislation reflects our, our new ambitions and our new targets. Of course, COVID is the great unknown, so even though we're going back to a certain rhythm, it's, it's hard to plan for the future uh, with this pandemic, and that is also being felt in Brussels and when you talk to people informally. Uh, so there's never a guarantee on the timeline. Having said that, there's one thing for sure, uh, and the Commission's uh, representatives are very strong in, in, in that, and that is that the European Green Deal is here to stay, and the European Green Deal is Europe's growth strategy. Franz Timmermans, the executive vice president of the European Commission, when speaking to the European Parliament, said, do not think that the Green Deal is a luxury that we can't afford. On, a contra on the contrary, it's a lifeline out of the virus. So the way Europe will bounce back and the way Europe's economy will bounce back from the impact of this pandemic is the way of the European Green Deal. That's a firm commitment that we hear every day here in Brussels. Uh, and it's, it's a, our firm commitment that this is really uh, the investment and in regulatory priorities that we can expect to see from the European Union over the next few years. So in Lighting Europe, we're working hard to influence these, to, to shape the future in a way that helps us uh, roll out and accelerate the, the uptake of, of great lighting technology uh, and making sure that we have good rules, simple, easy to understand, a good, healthy regulatory and business environment for companies looking to do business on the EU market. If you want to find out more, you're very welcome to contact my, either myself or a member of the Lighting Europe Secretariat team. You will find all our contact details online, and we'd be very happy to welcome you in our meetings and working groups and to work with you, uh, get your expertise, your company views, and help shape the future rules and policies that will guide the European market for lighting over the next five to ten years. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>